This is Duke University. Let me tell you what we've tried to do on this program. Uh, I've been going around, uh, it's fun to talk, but I like to listen too. Uh, so I've been interviewing people from Duke about issues of general interest. <coughs> this summer, it occurred to me that perhaps the healthcare uh, 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 issue or problem would not have been solved by the beginning of October. <laughs> <laughs> that you might be interested in hearing some smart people talk about it. Uh, I have the great luxury of hanging out with smart people, uh, and I call two, and I have them with me. I'll tell you quickly who they are, and I'll ask them up here, and then I'll uh, uh, ask them some questions. Uh, the first is this, uh, my excellent colleague, my excellent friend, Victor Zhao, who is the chancellor of the Duke University Health System, and basically the leader of everything medical at Duke. Victor was my first recruit uh, as president uh, and uh, came from Harvard. He had a chair in medicine so old they didn't even know the word medicine then. He was called the Percy Professor of Physic. Is that not true? Uh, well, it's better, better than magic, I guess. Uh, uh, of Medicine at Brigham and Women's uh, uh, came to Duke in 2004, took over a great medical center, a great health system, and has since just helped push it forward in so many ways. Uh, it is a great healthcare business, that's not unimportant. It is that in Victor's time we've also given extraordinary thought to questions of patient safety and quality of care. Uh, you have pushed the research side. Uh, we, I think we were one year uh, when you were head, we were the second highest funded uh, school uh, in NIH funding, and another year we were fourth. Uh, you have pushed the issue of translation, taking research inventions and carrying them out into the world of application and uh, real, uh, real use. Uh, you have pushed us internationally to Singapore, Beijing, all the other places we are, and you have also helped push Duke out locally into the Durham community. We are the principal health giver uh, for, this, uh, for the county of Durham. I think what 80 or 90 percent of the population gets its health care from Duke. So we know something about, about, about health care. Uh, and, and you're not the only one who's done it, but you have provided great leadership for it. Uh, so Victor's going to be in one chair. I get to be in the middle. Uh, then the other person is, whose name seems to be known to some of you since several people have mentioned it almost swooning in advance. Uh, <laughs> he's not, a, he knows who I'm talking about. Uh, this is Paul Farmer. Paul Farmer is one of the great figures in global health in this time and one of the great humanitarian figures, I believe, of this, uh, of this time. He is a person who has understood that when we talk about inequalities of the world, we're talking about inequalities of income, inequalities of education, but the inequality of health is one of the profoundest inequalities and helps to uh, produce many other ones. Also inequalities of access to health and health uh, and health care. Uh, this is a person who has studied the subject, has written about it, has represented the issue, but I think what everyone who knows his name knows, this is a person who has walked the walk. Uh, this is a person who has lived his life in uh, uh, rural communities in Haiti, who has lived his life in Rwanda, who has lived his life in American cities, uh, in places where people live the challenges of health inequalities. This is not a theoretical subject for you. Uh, and I think your moral passion and personal commitment is uh, one of the principal sources of your authority. You perhaps have read a book about him by Tracy Kidder called Mountains Beyond Mountains. It was the assigned freshman reading my first year as a freshman at Duke. Uh, uh, you may have heard of him as winning MacArthur Awards and pretty much every other kind of award you could have done. Uh, perhaps you know, he too, I don't know why we keep mentioning this university, uh, he has a faculty appointment at Harvard where he is uh, the chair of global health and social medicine. Uh, but what I think everyone in the world needs to remember, and certainly everyone at Harvard, uh, is uh, that he found his calling not there, but rather while the student at Duke. <laughs> Paul Farmer is a person who never fails to respond when his university calls. Take heed of this lesson. <laughs> uh, I called him my first weeks as president. You came to talk to our freshman class. That was fantastic. Uh, you've come back to launch our global health program. You've come back over and over again. Uh, and most recently, you've come back to be our newest trustee. Uh, Victor Zhao, Paul Farmer, come up and join me.
Away goes the podium. Enough for, enough for some coziness, okay? <laughs> Are we feeling cozy? Uh, I need to tell you one thing about Victor, which is Victor has laryngitis. And although I speak with him almost like twice a week, I've known you for almost six years and you never were sick before. Uh, but Victor has hastened to tell me, such as his interest in public health, that he's not in any way infectious. H1 and one negative. Totally negative. So, uh, yeah, but you, but you didn't shake my hand on Tuesday. <laughs> Let me, all right, so, so this is fun. Uh, just for the sake of efficiency, I'm going to ask these people some questions on your behalf because they're questions Thank that an audience would be interested, I think, to, uh, to hear uh, answers to. And Paul, maybe I could just begin with you. Uh, I have given addresses on you to incoming freshmen at Duke, and the whole point is they think they're supposed to know who they're going to be when they graduate. But no one really knows that when they come to college. You don't go to college because you know who you are already going to be. You go to find out who you might become. And I hold up you as an example, and I say, Paul Farmer wasn't Paul Farmer, wasn't on his way to being Paul Farmer before he came to Duke. So how, so how did it happen? Well, I was captain of the football team. <laughs> Really stellar record. <laughs> it, it's it, what, you, what you said is true, and I, I try to uh, in my teaching. And I, one thing you didn't mention is uh, who yeah, my boss was. The NFL of. years, and then before the after the NFL years, uh, my boss was none other than Victor Zhao <laughs> um, at Harvard, and, and I learned a lot about to get, uh, putting together programs from from Victor. But going back to those years. There's a cer certain burden, I think, that young people feel that is not productive. You know, they're expected to know too much about what they want to do at too early a time. You know, I think about the European, I don't know if this is still true, but um, what I take to be is this European, or at least uh, systems in parts of Europe where they're sort of sluicing young people into traps very early on. That's right. And I, I'm not a historian or a sociology of higher education, but you know, I don't think it's a good idea. I met some people tonight here who are, you know, really being thoughtful in their mid twenties about what they want to do, and I think that's right. I think you have to give yourself time. I knew I wanted to be a doctor when I went to Duke, but why? I have no idea. I didn't have any doc. There was no doctors in my family. I hadn't ever been to a doctor. <laughs> so that's our great American healthcare system for you. <laughs> You know, a family of eight ought to have health insurance. Would you note to Victor? Make I sure that happens. I'll, I'll, I'll tell my representative. Uh, but I didn't so, know. So, yeah, but I mean, so you came and you vaguely, well, what, probably a third of the people who come to Duke as undergraduates think they want to be a doctor. Yeah. And some of them are right and some of them are wrong. And some of them are wrong. <laughs> I think it was maybe a little more than so what, so, so, like, you know, just give, give us a little of the color of the kind of experiences that gave you a sense of how to you know, that gave, that gave you the sense of what the direction was going to be? Um, so I went into, um, you know, started taking science classes. Actually, Sterling's father was my organic chemistry professor. <laughs> so, great man, Helen Wilder. Um, and I, um, I really, what I really enjoyed was um, biochemistry. Our teacher's still there, Barbara Shaw. I see her when I go down there. I don't know if any of you have had her as a, uh, as a teacher. She was a great teacher. And I would take any class with medical in it, I just casting about, so medical ethics, and then I took a class called medical anthropology. It was 1980, and I think it was 1980. Now, of course, you can just, since they've blown off the third floor of the Allen Building, you can't find the registrar to find out if that's right. <laughs> I'll go check. Um, and I took a class called medical anthropology, and I, um, and it just opened, uh, you know, opened me up intellectually many ways. I, I started working at an emergency room, uh, the Duke emergency room, and just saw the social world revealed for me in a new way. How poverty, race, class, gender, how they work to sculpt people's experience of illness. And then I had the, the teachers and the, <coughs> the intellectual material that I needed to help me understand this. And, uh, and I just, that's when I really discovered what I wanted to do. That's what led me to Haiti, that's what led me to global health, that's what led me to health disparities, which I'm still working on, as you mentioned, in Boston as, uh, as an African. So really, that's something I'm very proud to be able to say to 
undergraduates everywhere is just be open. And you could say, well, I already knew I wanted to be a doctor, but really, for what reason? I found that out too. So uh, you knew Paul before I knew you. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> I was one person who was initially was, sad when he said he was going to go to Duke. My boss at Harvard. I, I was uh, coach of his football team. Uh, <laughs> uh, first time they had a Chinese coach. <laughs> you know, I think your question about how did Paul Farmer become Paul Farmer, and I think that part of Victor's hour is also because I encountered Paul Farmer. Uh, when I returned from Stanford to Harvard back in 1996, I think, right? and people told me about this guy, Paul Farmer, who was doing all these great things, all our residents, all the young people were going to work with Paul in Haiti and everywhere else. But then I realized that Paul was a one-man show uh, while he had Jim Kim. But Jim was a hospitalist and Paul was infectious disease and was and I became very intrigued how you were able to do all the things you were able to do. Now for those who read the book, Tracy Kidder, I think Paul had a nickname called Paul Foreigner. <laughs> so I, 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 I finally got it and I said, this is great stuff, Paul. And actually John MacArthur was one who pointed that out to me. And because from my own background, where I grew up in post-war China, it always meant a lot to me about addressing health disparities. But watching what you do and how you inspire people, I was uh, head of medicine, I'm a molecular cardiologist, and then I said, boy, this is something that we can really channel some of our resource and energy to create something more than uh, at least what we were able to do at the time. Well, it interests me because here I'm looking at the front row as my person who heads our global health program uh, and has made it within three or four years one of the notable ones in the, uh, in the country. Uh, but that was just an idea five years ago, really. Uh, and we had a couple things that helped bring it about. One was great co cooperation across the faculty. Uh, two was the fact that that was the year the book about you was the assigned reading, so everybody had it on their mind, and then you came, uh, and you were like the uh, which I say the Elvis of global health, if I may say. Uh, and then uh, furthermore, the fact that you, Victor, instead of saying, that's not what we do here, uh, completely understood the concept of well, why does health need to be understood as something that is in this country and around the world? Why does it need to be understood as something that has a social dimension as well as a medical dimension? Uh, I'm just looking at you. You know, you have worked in every aspect. You've worked in many countries. You've worked on many diseases. Uh, and in the last, I don't know when you first were in the field, certainly in the last 20 years, you've seen a lot of things directed at global health problems. You've seen a lot of medicine sent. You've seen a lot of volunteers. You've seen a lot of government action. Uh, you've seen a lot of foundation support. Uh, and I'm, I, I would just ask you a question. It's, it's rather large, but you can figure out how to answer it. In your experience, which, you know, everybody in the world wants to make a difference. What has made, of the things that have been done, what has made a difference in the field of global health in the time you've been in this country? Well, you know, I think, I'm going to use a little public health jargon if I can. I, I, um, it, it is jargon, and I, and I hope you'll forgive me, but if we, in public health, and, and Michael will, will can give the same talk and, and often has, in public health, you look at um, and the same, but what I'm about to say is true, you know, if you're looking at the university in general or, um, or lots of, uh, looking at uh, the biggest so, uh, social problems every day, so, so environment, yeah, environmental challenges, for example. But there, if you take a focus on just one thing, that's in public health jargon a vertical program, right? So, you know, if you have a program for cardiac surgery, or tuberculosis, or diabetes control. That that kind of balkanization. Oh, you know. By the way, I've I've been doing volunteer work with uh, at the UN, and they actually asked me not to say balkanization. <laughs> so, uh, so then, by the way, so this is this was just recently. Like, okay, um, how about silos? And one of my colleagues from Harvard said, "I'm from the Midwest, and I resent this." <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, vertical. <laughs> that seems more neutral. So a vertical program can be a great way of organizing enthusiasm for a problem. And I've seen some really powerful vertical 
public health programs happen, so it's, so it's of all of us, Mike is in all of us. But that's not going to be translated into meaningful um, long-term changes for poor people, uh, in whether we're talking about poor people in a rich country or poor people in a poor country. You know, that, that's my constituency, is people living in poverty. What we need is to build health systems. And that's you know, one thing that I've seen. The second is there has to be a focus on implementation. So first is integration. You know, um, how do we integrate these programs that are meaningful change health systems? The, the, and the other is implementation. This is one of the things that Victor, uh, wor we worked on this at Harvard, is there's lots of good ideas, there's lots of enthusiasms, there's even some resources now that we certainly didn't have 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, focused on health disparities in the United States, on big health problems that were unaddressed in, say, Africa, like malaria, AIDS, tuberculosis. These are great developments. Anybody who tells you these are not great developments is, is not trying to serve those who need the interventions. But now, how can we get this enthusiasm implemented on the ground? And if I were to choose one thing, I would say, for there to be a there there, you need to work with community health workers. You need to work with people in their home, villages and towns and cities. And you know, you can't bring in someone like me to, um, or someone like Victor or someone like the students. They can't go in and replace local uh, Cause, workers. Because you're unlikely to stay there forever. Uh, and if they rely on doctors, well, we had a conference at Duke about African health workers where we learned what to be here. Twenty-four percent of the ill health in the world is in Africa. And percent of the health workers. Uh, so it's a matter of figuring out other, uh, other people than doctors. I think so, and nurses are also nurses, doctors, social workers. These are highly trained professionals who are in scarce supply. You know, if you look at mental health problems in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'll bet you there are not more than 100 or 150 psychiatrists in Sub-Saharan Africa outside of South Africa, and they're all in cities. So if you're working as I am in Rwanda, you know, whether you talk about um, yeah, surviving genocide, trauma of all sorts, PTSD, whatever moniker you might use, you know, you need a community health worker based program. Same for diabetes, where diabetes is a problem, and on and on. So, you know, that's something we've done also in Boston, and Victor has been, was a great patron of this work. Um, uh, it, you know, we have community health workers in Boston as well. I was in Africa not too long ago arguing. <coughs> Um, this is again back to what Mike does, arguing for health system strengthening. Not a very jazzy term, right? Health system strengthening. And I said, you know, really community health workers to support their efforts. And uh, one of my colleagues from Africa, you know, from actually he was from Nigeria, he was from a big city, he said, uh, well, you know, Dr. Farmer, I bet you wouldn't, this was in, in Kigali, Rwanda, by the way, big conference. He said, I bet you wouldn't, I bet you don't say that, you know, for the United States, you should have community health workers there. And I said, but that's exactly what I say in the United States. Because it's just as true here as it is there. For us to manage chronic disease and to have a there there, we really need to roll this out, not just to community health centers, but into people, into communities. Well, now I'm going to look at Victor because, like you, I would. Um, in a, you know, in a university setting, on the one hand, we're not in Rwanda. Our students are, our faculty are. We're not in Haiti. Uh, but of course, we have an asset, which is all these sort of people have such incredible enthusiasm for dealing with issues of this sort. Uh, and I guess what I'd ask you, if you have the resource of education and research and enthusiasm, uh, what do you figure, how, how does the university use those assets the best uh, to me? I, I want to make sure I, I follow what Paul was saying from my perspective. I think, first of all, global health is local and international, how we define global. So, in fact, almost everything you say about what's happening in Haiti, Rwanda, you can actually look at it in the backyard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I think when you, I think public health is a piece of the whole healthcare system. And consequently, the involvement of community, uh, the delivery of care, the implementation, and the use of community workers, churches, family members, yes. etc. Really, that's the way to go. That's what we're building in 
Durham as well. Well, tell us a little about the Durham stuff, because actually, you know, everybody who knows about the medical school knows, uh, from a distance, knows Teddy Kennedy came to have an advanced experimental surgery or the NIH rankings or something of that sort. Uh, but probably people at a distance don't have much of a sense of how the community base has been involved. Well, I, I'm pretty proud of what we're doing in Durham because if you look at the health statistics, people will say it doesn't look very good. And the traditional way people look at a medical center, it's a place people come to get care, the ivory tower. And what we've done in the last several years is to turn that around and create a system, a network in which you deliver care in the community and really begin to focus on the health of the community rather than the statistics of, you know, how many successful surgeries have we done this past year, how many brain transplants and all that stuff that we do. Are you doing brain transplants? <laughs> okay, yeah. Are you doing brain transplants again? Just brain transplants again, Victor. You can just hear his mother say, oh, that's him in young brains. He doesn't know <laughs> Anyway, so I think what we've done a lot is, you know, particularly is the creation of uh, uh, this thing called medical homes. I think you've read about this. It's a big deal now in healthcare reform. We really like to call it connected care because it's really not a very good term. In which we now clearly have a team approach, base approach, looking at the patients, not only around the doctor, but around the patient, and around teams of healthcare workers that ranges all the way to and important to focus on care coordination, care navigation, you know, all the kind of things that you need to do in order to minimize the, the illness in the community. The project we do right now, which I think is interesting, if you allow me to take a minute, is that we actually reverse the usual way in which academic centers uh, approach this. Usually, academic centers will go into, say, community. You know, you've got diabetes, You've got uh, obesity, we're going to come here and help you do screening, we're going to help you do all those things. Uh, Rock Caleb initiated a thing called the Durham Health Initiative, and we end up asking the community to tell us what the issues are. And we organize teams of 30 with people in the community principally, and the health system, and different people to look at what are the critical issues in the community, what do we need to address. We just finished, really, I think, a big investment, over 400 people involved with this, churches, schools, you name it, and came up with some commonality. Guess what they are? Access, care navigation, right? convenience, medication management. So I think this is really what it is, that when you listen to the community, it's not trying to take one disease or the other, but to fix the system by which people can get the health care and improve the health in the community. That, I think, is where things are going. That's where I think where health care reform needs to go. Yeah. And as you know, in some of these bills, they do have pilots for accountable care organization, asking that you're responsible for the outcomes of the community of people you take care of. I think we're very well prepared, David. I think we've done so much in this, I'm very proud of it. Well, when I go see it, and it interests me, everybody knows about our medical school and our nursing school, but it's also the university that originated the physician's assistance program. Yes, well, there's yes. lots, of, lots of different things that could be put together in teams to respond to health at various levels of acuity. Uh, and I will say, when you come back to Duke, I'd be happy to take you to the National Museum or the Bostock Library, but I would be very proud to take you to the community clinics in former rat-infested, falling-down elementary schools that have been brought back. Uh, and now put health, it means you don't wait till you're really sick and go in an ambulance to Duke. Uh, rather, it's in your neighborhood there. You was in the homelessness school. I was there. Yeah, yeah. yeah we just opened up that another one. I mean, we serve the community and 80-90% of people have no insurance. But we don't really ask the question anymore. We just figure that's the right thing to do. And it turns out it's actually very good in the sense that our emergency soon are going to be flooded with people who are not getting appropriate care you know, and uh, being very sick. And I think it's a win-win from my perspective. I think you're already answering the question, but I'll go back and ask it anyway. 
which is, you know, there's a version of global health in which global health is understood to mean not U.S. health. Yeah. Right? Um, and actually, I thought this quite interesting. Uh, there was a gathering of universities that have global health programs in Bethesda not very many weeks back, and I spoke at it. Uh, and it was quite interesting, because uh, Duke sort of emphasized that point considerably. And you can see that there were some places that really did think of global health as foreign, foreign health, or you know what I mean, international, not ours. Uh, but you're speaking as if there's not an identity of U.S. health experience with that in Haiti or Rwanda, but a continuity of some elements. Well, you know, I think that, uh, that international health is just the wrong concept. It's a very dated concept. And if you, if you look at its, its roots, you know, and I, I've been interested in this, you know, 19th, 20th century, how does, you know, how, what are the roots of global health? They're in, you know, colonial medicine, and there's interesting advances that were made then, and then came the birth in the mid 20th century of these international organizations like the WH, the UN and the WHO a little bit later. The Pan American Health Organization, by the way, is much older than the World Health Organization, and its roots are in the Panama Canal. You know, it comes right out of that, trying to build late 19th century. The French fail, as they often do, to <laughs> build a That was a joke. This is why they don't ask me. They don't ask me. I'm either kidding. to the Balkans or to France. <laughs> That's the first, uh, speaking of foreign, that's the first place I went to Duke, Duke program with France. And uh, so I was just kidding for any of you who are Franco uh, Americans. Um, the French failed to build, you know, they built the Suez Canal and they, they, they didn't pull off the Panama Canal they, as if they were doing it. The local labor, everybody was working on it because of yellow fever and probably malaria. So, uh, and, you know, then came. The idea it was actually a Cuban and an American, you know, Walter Reed was involved in this, uh, Dr. Finlay uh, from Cuba, uh, you know, saying, look, the vector is mosquito. We have to have public health intervention. So that's sort of the birth of the Pan American Health Organization, which led to the others. Global health is really global as opposed to international, in my view, because there are love, there are disparities, as, as, as Victor said, in Durham and in Boston and Washington, D.C. is a classic example. There's a, classic slide, teaching slide, where you just follow a certain subway line and look at life expectancy at birth from one end to the other. I forgot what line it is. Um, somebody here would know. Green. The green line is also reads to the Brigham, so I have to be <laughs> But in any case, that, that is a, an important distinction. And I think young people get it. At least, you know, in my experience at Duke or Harvard, other, but they, they really get that we're talking about health disparities, and we, we really need to think about, um, and just think like, a, uh, just think like H1N1 does. Sorry to say it that way, but, you know, as an infectious disease doctor who looks at pandemic disease, the creation of the nation state is a fairly recent, you know, again, there are historians here, but it's, it's really, uh, uh, it's really uh, 19th, 20th century. The bugs move all over the place, the microbes, so having the nation state or the county or whatever administrative unit you might choose as your unit of analysis. Really I learned that that wasn't a, the way to look at it um, when I was studying at Duke and you know, it served me well ever since to understand things much more permeably and flexibly. Well, That's what global health is like. Well, and you look at the movement of peoples around the world and so you've got populations in one country that actually recently lived in another country and all the things that go with it. And I remember when I read the uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, one of the things I found striking was it wasn't... How come you never read my books? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I only like to read about <laughs> That's not true. I read Pathologies of Power. That's a good one. Um, the, um, Big hit with publishers. <laughs> <laughs> but where was I? <laughs> I think back in the moments. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it in a somewhat different way. Uh, so now we come to a city in which uh, uh, Political progress seems to have halted on any number of issues until healthcare is resolved some way or other, or at least so it seems to those who read uh, read the read the papers. Uh, I don't wish to tempt either of you into a tendentious uh, uh, position, uh, but could I just get a little take from you if you were? Uh, you know, they, I, they they call you from Washington. I know you've been up here actually many times consulting on it. Uh, how, how do you feel about the issues that are being addressed and aren't being addressed? In the, in the, 
Bill, I do want to answer your question because I made it up the point. You know, <laughs> Whenever I say that, I have to answer it. You know, I, I just want to emphasize that global health, I mean, Duke has the whole mantra about learning in the service of society. So, right? it, it's really a bi directional learning and learning opportunity. I mean, so much, I mean, it's not a recognition of what we can do outside of our country to help these poor people. I think one of the wonderful things we've learned in return. I think Paul, your DOTS program to me, DOTS program is a good example in which you're implementing in Boston. So, but Paul's, if you read uh, months and months, it's described that in fact, the people directly observe what they're taking their medicine for TB, and that greatly reduce drug resistance TB. Yeah, right? And we now do that using family members, community members, and I, the, the project today, I spent actually an hour at McKinsey today because we're working on a project we we're working on the forum, talking about innovation delivery. But we're looking as, as a project, and there's a whole steering committee with lots of stakeholders, Rockefeller, et cetera, is to say, how are other countries solving the problem of delivery in a resource-constrained environment? Yeah. And you'd be amazed how creative people are in different parts of the world. And you know, take the cell phone. And in India, right, 90% all have cell phones. And I think our question is, how do you learn from this? What are the barriers, what successes? Can you scale it up? Can you help other countries? And can actually we bring it back to the United States? Okay, now I'm gonna ask my question this, again. This, this it's a long way, form. but now, okay, now I'm gonna ask it another way, and I have no idea exactly. if anybody's gonna answer this or not, which is, do you, do you think that part of the problem in this country is that we have a perception of being resource unconstrained? I mean, places yeah. where people where resources are constrained, people know how to accomplish things with restraints. Yeah. I mean, 16, yeah. I mean, 16% of GDP, boy, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's twice, you know, twice what a lot of European countries, I mean, I'm not an expert in this arena, um, in, in the sense of being a healthcare economist, but again, I think we can learn, as Victor said, from from other experiences. And the example that you're, you gave, you, and, and you know, dots, by the way, it, it means directly observed therapy. And I'm not so sure, it's not, a, it's not a term that's really taken off. And we've actually, um, in our work, used another term which fits with what you're doing in, in Durham County, sorry, what we're doing in Durham County, trustee. <laughs> um, what we're doing in Durham County, how would I do? Um, and that is accompaniment. That's a word that we, we use a lot. And it, it, Actually, I got it from theology. You're not allowed to talk about theology at Harvard. You actually get struck by lightning. <laughs> I'm kidding. By the way, you know the chair that he held is so old? It was, I think it's his chair at Harvard, which is a very amusing concept, <laughs> uh, the, the Hersey chair. It was founded, I think, in 1789. Oh, really? It's a Congo chair of medicine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's, a, it's the oldest chair in the United States or some such thing. They love to say it. It's not like that at Harvard. <laughs> um, but uh, the Victor's successors, you know, was during the economic crisis. I probably shouldn't say this on, on film, but it's too late now. Uh, <laughs> you know what's going on. So uh, <laughs> he was. Uh, there's all these tussles in some universities, right? You know, and, and, and I think the attitude that you described at the beginning from the podium, it's, the, it's a great attitude, you know, to say, what can we do well with what we've got? This is back to the healthcare question, but the, the man who succeeded Victor in that chair was also a cardiologist. Um, he said, I'm going to calculate how much interest on 4,000 pounds sterling from 1789. And I think he said to have said to a certain community-based college based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I want my $500 million back. <laughs> I don't know if you really said that. But back to learning from other places. So directly observed therapy, you know, roll, this is, accompaniment is a better term. It's really rolling rolling things out to the, the household. And, uh, and I think we can use that concept in looking at healthcare reform in this country, you know. Um, how would we do that? Well, uh, I think 16% of the GDP is a lot if we're not getting the return that we need. And uh, and I, you know, I don't know if it's true. People say, well, we can't keep building cars because we spend more on healthcare than steel. I don't see why that would be false if someone said that. Maybe that is true. 
Now, there's clearly some places that can do it more effectively, more responsive to chronic disease, or the kind of problems that we have in the way that you, you described for Durham County. And um, it also could create jobs in the United States. So you get to, I understand unemployment is something like 15% in California. Is that true? Yeah, 13. So it's still a lot. All right. Um, you know, it's probably 60, 70 percent in Haiti, and they, uh, you know, unemployment outside of you know formal employment. But one of the things that I think would be good to do is create a company, you know, a company in position, healthcare promoters who who can. You know, it's a it's a way to create a you know jobs that could be springboards to other um, satisfying jobs to people. I read in the New York Times say that the community colleges in our country are on overdrive. I think that's a good thing. You know that people are. You know, going into to university and college. So, I think this healthcare delivery question has real, real legs in our country, in this country, in the United States. We can do a lot more to roll it out, roll out healthcare. And you know, when I say healthcare, I'm also talking about what you're talking about: rat infested schools. We can't have that. We can't have, we can't have these basic problems unaddressed in, in our in such an affluent and prosperous. It's absolutely prosperous of the same. <laughs> so I, I think that President Obama said it right in the sense that we are looking for quality, access, and affordability, right? And I think if you look across the world, everybody's looking for those three fundamental, you know, elements. And most countries can only do two out of three, no matter how you to put them together. And I think the preoccupation at this point of time about cost and also, of course, the insurance reform has taken away the focus, in my opinion, of access and quality. And that's what we need to focus on. And now there are elements of health care reform bill which I think will move towards that area. But when I saw uh, uh, Senator Tom Daschle about two weeks ago, I said, where's the conversation? I guess that's going to be put on hold until all this gets passed in some way in terms of getting deeper into the argument about how can we improve the quality of care. Yeah. And that involves delivery system changes, payment reform, right, and many other issues. So I think that's, uh, that's where I think uh, the gap at this point in time is. Although I think there's a lot of discussion, but in fact there's not enough, in, in my opinion, of really putting into the bill in terms of beginning the change of the quality of care that we need to give. Okay. Let, let me ask another, uh, I, I learn a lot by being the colleagues of people who work in fields outside my own expertise. Uh, and one of the earliest things I learned when I came to Duke and started working with global health uh, people is uh, that developing countries tend to continue to have some of the old health challenges while developing not only prosperity, but the health challenges that tend to be correlated with prosperity, uh, such as the rise of obesity in countries where there used to not be enough food, uh, the rise of cardiovascular issues, the rise of diabetes, things of, things of this sort. Uh, and I guess for me, it's a different kind of challenge. And certainly, we know in this country we have we, we have the problem of health care, but we have the problem of growing ill health in this country. And we know we know we do correlated with lifestyle issues to some extent. I don't think that's the only answer. Uh, what what is what what is from your idea an effective attack on those kinds of issues? Uh, well, again, a lot of the discussion will. Um, it's, it's sort of based on outmoded understandings of uh, the burden of disease. Um, it has probably not been true for some time that communicable diseases are a leading killer. I mean, acute myocardial infarction, I believe, is the leading cause of death in India. And, um, and I, I assume that complications of coronary disease are, are, are major killers across Asia. And this notion of you know, poor countries have communicable diseases and rich countries have chronic non-communicable diseases hasn't, I don't know if it was ever true. You know? And so I think, uh, again, not to go back to this one-stop shopping plan, but you know, community health um, workers um, 
can help, I think, in that arena as well. Now let me just say something that maybe, maybe Victor will agree with, maybe you won't. But uh, one of our, a couple of our colleagues at Harvard, who again were um, people I was allowed to recruit because Victor said, you need to build this docking station for global health care. Uh, a couple of them were cardiologists, and they're working on, they're, instead of, they're not Luddites, you know, they're not saying, oh, we don't need these interventions or medicines, so they're saying, okay, maybe we should develop, you know, um, a deliverable, and they're talking about, you know, uh, cholesterol lowering and, uh, drugs and antihypertensives that we can, you know, give more conveniently to people. Um, yes, there are lifestyle changes, yes, you know, people need to um, exercise more and lose weight, etc. But sometimes it's important not to be, a, you know, a Luddite about, about these matters. Um, and so this talk of a poly pill where there's actually uh, a number of secret magical ingredients. I mentioned uh, cholesterol lowering drugs and, and antihypertensive. Maybe that's going to be a really smart answer in the end. Just like, you know, certain vitamins and, and folic acid is good for, you know, um, for, uh, during pregnancy. So I, I don't know if that's going to be the oh. case, but... I think that first, um, the disease burden of uh, chronic disease and cardiovascular disease rising and is predicted to be the number one disease burden in the globe. And I think that we, what we need to understand, I sometimes have to the really nice, they say, the genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So what we really have to do is think about the things that we can prevent, which is the environment, which comes down to Prevention, again, something we need to do in this country in healthcare reform, right? And prevention elsewhere. And I think the biggest challenge I'm feeling is that nobody owns prevention, right? So you can say, where's public health? Well, public health talks about it, but they don't have an effect at all. The doctors are too busy taking care of patients that don't have reimbursement. So they say the health system should be doing this. I think it's everybody's responsibility employers, workers, churches and to work together to do true prevention. Behavioral sciences, we don't emphasize enough behavioral sciences. I mean, that's really where the big gap is. You know, I don't think that people are born just simply because they want to eat until they get fat or whatever. I mean, there's genetic issues, but I think we have to understand what are the issues of behavior and how can we make a difference? We need to invest a lot more money into those areas, right? I think those are the critical issues prevention, wellness, behavioral sciences, and changing the environment. Can I, can I just add something yeah. to that? The, the, so the poly pill, by the way. Yeah. I think yeah, I right about that. You, yeah, no, you're right. So the poly pill, the idea would be that there's enough evidence that certain medications, and some of you may be on it, ACE inhibitors, aspirin, statins, are making a difference in people with heart disease. And so the idea would be, look, it's difficult to prescribe these things to every individual high trigger dose, so why not put this into a single pill, you know, with some fixed doses and give it to the population, and therefore the impact theoretically would be high. And I think that could well be correct, right? You know, if you would have asked me, and you did ask me, we were on the phone last week, what we were talking about, what we were going to talk about, I would not have guessed I would have talked about the poly pill. Really? I would not have. But I will say that one of the big tr problems that I see, and this is back to, to what to your previous question is, is again back to disparities. You know, is at a time when I mean, it's not as if we're living in two or th as they used to say, three different worlds: first world, second world. That's those are social fictions in a way. So at the same time that we have obesity is a huge problem, so is food security. Sometimes in the same. Country, you know, and so having just come back yesterday from Haiti, you know, where um, if you if you go to if you look among the the well-to-do in Haiti, their healthcare problems are the same as the well-to-do here. You know, it's um, but at the same time there are huge problems with food insecurity. I've seen this in Africa, and, and this is another. This is sort of the biggest challenge, and <coughs> personally, in, 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 not personally, but. And the work we're doing is spanning this, these worlds of sometimes they're in a single nation, or but certainly in the same. If you go from in a single city, 
it's in, and this is why we keep going back to the, the notion of health disparities, because at the same time that you're dealing with obesity, you're dealing with people who don't have enough to, to eat at all. And you know, the, I just was reviewing, I'm giving a talk early tomorrow morning in another city, which I won't mention by name, but which is, contains five boroughs. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm giving a talk on economic and social rights. And you know, and I just went over some of the data from you know, Haiti, and uh, you know, there are, there's a big problem with hunger still, you know, right there. And, and so maybe the term we should use, maybe the broader terms we should use, in addition to global health equity, health disparities, are probably also, you know, food insecurity. Could, we could use that to also think about people who have to eat the, too much of the wrong kinds of food. So there are these general concepts, I think, um, that are that are probably applicable. Um, and, and don't forget climate change and the environment. Yeah. Well, you know, I would I was going to go back to that. I was saying today at a meeting in, in a, at Partners in Health at a board meeting today. Sign up. The two biggest problems I see are food and fuel. Um, and, you know, this is in our own work in 11 countries, with um, 12 countries maybe. It, you know, we have to find green ways to power our clinics and hospitals as well. So I think this is the kind of thing that we're seeing from young people at places like Duke. They, they're getting this in a broader way and they're not having this balkanized reading of all these problems. Uh, I'm just trying to think. I'm a, I'm a member of this audience too, and I'm you know I've been listening to all this, and I'm putting it together in my mind. Uh, and I guess if I were to try to summarize what I would have learned from this, uh, it's that the issue of global health is the issue of health everywhere, uh, and that the issue of health everywhere has lots of issues simultaneously. And if you approach it as one, the trouble is it's also others, and so it's partly a matter of medicine. Right? There's things you can solve with a pill, you can't solve with other means. Uh, it's partly a matter of systems you've talked about. How do you put together the teams of workers with the right skills? Uh, how do you bring it close enough to people? Uh, it's partly a matter of legislation and policy. It's partly a matter of just the underlying facts of nature and, and, and culture in places where people live. Uh, food, food issues uh, and then the rights, the unequal rights to uh, uh, to, to the good things of life. Uh, and then I bring that back to the idea that really is at the, in the bottom of my mind when I go to a conversation like this, which is, what can a university do about these issues? Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll ask you for an answer, but I'm going to give my own first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you want to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by talking about the kind of thing that Duke is trying to do, uh, it seems to me they're really summarized in two things. We're trying to make it such that academic education is part of an arc that reaches out into the world of actual experience and brings the lessons of experience back into academic practice so you know how to revise the questions to make them uh, to, 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 to make them more, more, more important or, 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 or consequential. Uh, and then second, uh, it's our view uh, that the world has spent too long training people to narrow their focus, and that we need to train people uh, to learn how to understand uh, uh, various aspects of a problem simultaneously, and how themselves and with teams of people to come together to act on the multiple dimensions or multiple determinants of a problem. Uh, so actually, it seems to me that sort of the university strategy and the kind of diagnosis you have given seem to me to have a, 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 a considerable impact. Uh, still, if I ask myself, what can a university do on issues like this? Partly it's research, policy research, medical research, uh, engineering research, nursing research. Why wouldn't it be business school research since all of these things are managerial problems at the end of the day? Uh, really, why wouldn't it be everything? Uh, we know the Divinity School is very active at Duke in these matters because there's places where a, 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 a faith community leaders are the principal authorities on health on healthcare matters. Uh, so it would be a matter of putting all those things together. So universities deliver research and universities link the training of promising young people to research uh, uh, and try to shape the way they want to go forward in life and address their skills. Uh, I, you know, I look, I, uh, I look at you as my excellent colleague shaping uh, Duke University, uh, but I'm always going to look at Paul Farmer in a special way as an average example of a student. <laughs> uh, uh, this person came from, do I not, am I not right, you lived in your childhood in a bus? 
That's right. right. If you live in a bus in a it was a tuberculosis trailer. diagnosis bus. Uh, if you live in a bus in a trailer park in Florida, a campground. My a camp sister, 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 sister. I don't want to exaggerate. It was a campground in Florida. You came to Duke. Uh, you did. You know, I pieced together your biography. It's completely fascinating. You know, you did all kinds of uh, serious and silly things. Uh, you had all kinds of friends. Uh, you had all kinds of experiences. Uh, you went and worked with uh, immigrant workers. And guess what? That's where you met Haitians. Was in Dora, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, with such consequence for your life. Uh, but it seems to me that really uh, the obligation of universities, universities can't solve the problems of the world. They're too small. Single universities can't. But A, they can work together with other networks of people, and B, they can turn out people who go out and use their strengths and their skills in, 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 in intelligent ways. Uh, I'm going to open this uh, to, to uh, a few questions from, uh, from the audience. Can I, can I pay you a compliment? I just think. I think that what's unique about Duke is that the, the collaboration and the interdisciplinary approaches to you know, all these issues. So you mentioned all the different schools, right? Let's not forget the school of environment. Let's not forget the policy, right? I mean, I think that the proximity of the medical school to the rest of the university, undergraduate students come over and work with us all the time. On the first day. Yeah, and I think it's just wonderful that how enthusiastic they are. They bring fresh ideas, fresh energy, and that just rejuvenates us. I think it is really in the creation of the Global Health Institute, we thought of it as not a medical <coughs> center of issues or public health issue. It's actually everything. And I think it pulls together all that we represent. So you asked me earlier the question that you answered. I'd say that Paul and I had this experience where we were at the lecture of uh, the president of a university which you have associated with was asked the question, why not give 1% of endowment? Those days was the worth a lot more. And you can cure TB. And I think the proper answer is exactly what you said. The environment is to create, and the universities create that kind of environment for research, for education, for the propagation of the next generation of people who's going to make a big difference. And that has much greater impact than giving X amount of money for a focus sure. area. We like that money, but that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, um, you know, look, I'm not going to try to improve on that. I think that's exactly right. And, um, and getting better, having universities get better at uh, generation of new knowledge in our research and transmitting it that is teaching. I think you know we have a long way to go, research universities. Um, to, but we're on. I think it's the right track. My friends, thank you for being a good audience, and my thanks to uh, you. Uh, you know, it's challenging in a room like this, uh, and we're all going to be around for a while afterward. Uh, but uh, let, let's take a few questions, and because uh, I'm, sure I'm sure there's plenty. I see one over here. President Broadhead, thank you, Dr. Zhao, uh, well, Dr. Farmer, and your talk reminded me of how much I appreciate my Duke education. And every day, I thank God for Duke. So thank you for that. Paul, I spent much of my post-Duke career on the country here ahead of you in economic. But why do you have more hair than I do? <laughs> I spent a lot of time, obviously, in a flour mill. That was uh, part of my hair here. But much of my career was spent in economic security and food uh, security issues in Africa and around the world. One of the issues I confronted uh, especially with AID and, and, and UN and, and third country projects, was this, this conflict between coming in and saying, hey, look how great we are, in order to be able to justify the funding, be able to, to get more funding, and where the successes were, which is really the suppression of the ego, and that you weren't really there. It was the empowerment of the communities where you work. You talk a lot about the community health work. And maybe, could you comment on that conflict? Because yeah. you need to be showing, hey, I'm doing these things. Duke needs to be showing, hey, I'm doing these things in order to get the funding. But yet the successes are really where you go off in the sunset and people say, hey, Paul Farmer, you know, he's a nice guy. I can't remember what he did. But yet, behind, left behind were the things that you were trying to achieve. And, and that's a tough conflict. It is a very tough conflict, I, and I see it as, as you know, on a couple levels. And the level that you're talking about, 
um, which is large-scale social policy and what is the purpose of, say, foreign aid, or what is what are we doing with it? I think that was different. You know, I mentioned already the roots of, you know, of uh, global health in the colonial enterprise, and some good health systems were built for those reasons, um, and some not so good. You know, you could actually grade, you know, I think various endeavors that were by colonial powers in Latin America and Africa, and say who gets an F, who gets a C, who gets a you know, you probably don't go much over a B. And then came the Cold War, right? And you know, after the, you know, after World War II, you know, we had the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan, you know, at one point, 2.4, 2.5 percent of the U.S. GDP went into rebuilding Europe. And there wasn't, you know, there were not a lot of con, there weren't contractors, there were not the professionalized. Uh, Aid, aid, you know, aid givers, and but they were a you know, it was a devastated continent. But they were they were literate people, etc. And and I think that that that's a model that we shouldn't forget. What happened? I mean, if the United States, the people of the United States, to brag a little about you know our people, I'm not speaking as an American, if 47 percent of American households would give money after the Asian tsunami, that says something really. Good about the United States. If two, you know, if we gave up to two plus percent of our GDP after, you know, in the Marshall Plan, that says something good. So I think there's something to be learned from those issues about how best to do this. That's just um, my view uh, on, on these matters, and I intend, you know, I, I like being involved, invited to share those views, and I want to be a participant in that, like a lot of Americans do. Certainly, the young people I teach. But then I would say just one little psychological side is it's very difficult and I would not trivialize it as I think I have in the past. I've trivialized unintentionally the quest for personal self-efficacy. And I had an experience actually with a cardiologist, what is it about this cardiologist, <laughs> who was a student of mine and I was talking about, you, you like this story, I was talking about health system strengthening, why we have to not reinvent the wheel for, you know, uh, let's say complications of coronary artery disease or if we've already got a good uh, plan for other chronic diseases, let's not reinvent the wheel. But the way I put it, this was at a seminar at Harvard, is why do we keep reinventing the wheel? And my former student, now colleague, said to me, because we want to reinvent the wheel. And I had an epiphany. I said, that's just one of the good things, of, you know, trying to push for personal excellence. You know, in, how do you think novelists write books, I guess, or painters paint? If we had Picasso out, you know, being a community health worker, he wouldn't have painted Guernica, you know. So I do think that someone in my position or, or yours or ones that you had before, we have to be careful to not dismiss personal self-efficacy. That's the sort of psychological part of the, of the response as well. That's not what you described, but I think that's also something we should reflect on as we look at global health and, and, um, and, and, and elevate that desire to do good things for other people, even as an individual. Now, how to link that to broader movements is a, is a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, yes, uh, I just finished my medical school at a, a small uh, school, East Rome, Carolina, East, ECU, and doing my MPH now. And so my question is, I mean, I'm inspired by the work, and I, and I hope to be in a, in a position to do this one day. But what, what do you, Places do like uh, I'm from Uttar Pradesh, India, where we don't have Paul Farmer in the Zambian Sante setting. What do we do in Eastern North Carolina where we don't have Duke and the endowment that they have and the health system and the expertise that they have? How do we make this scalable? How do we make this so that a Paul Farmer or Duke does not have to be there to have this kind of change? How do we replicate this? Sorry. I think the best asset of any organization's people not the money. The money helps. In fact, Paul will tell you, I think many of the program he started, or I started with him, or even then, I don't think we're talking about huge amount of resources. But you know, you eventually leverage it in order to find more resources. But what you really want is people who are passionate, who's committed, and who's going to willing to put time into making it happen. Anyway, I, you know, it doesn't have to be Duke 
Yeah, I mean, there's lots of stories about, you know, great successes everywhere. And I think East Carolina is a great university. And if you the right people, you can do a lot more than organizations with a lot more money without the right people. I think an interesting thing about global health at Duke is it has succeeded far beyond its revenue, uh, which is good because, you know, what did I, what did I tell you first at the beginning, you remember? Uh, which is, we don't ask ourselves, how much money do we have and what can we do with that amount of money? We say, what's important to do and how can we use the resources we have to do it? Uh, and I find that that's actually, uh, I'm looking at, I'm trying to make uh, eye contact with Mike Carson. Uh, we put up, we put up so fun, but the truth is, it was the contagion of people who wanted to work on this thing that has brought people. I, I call this an amplification thing. Yeah, okay, right. Low investment, the right person, and the right value can go a huge way. Imagine, I mean, that's what Paul's done in terms of the number of people he's trained, and the number of young people he want to work with. And I think both Dick and I have this fortune of having a career path that's in, that could influence a lot of young people. So can I, can I just add one? He has a follow-up question. I was just gonna say, I, I, now I feel like the problem isn't money as much as that person. Yeah, as well, that I, I wanna disagree. May I disagree? Yeah. Because I don't, I don't think, I just wanna, lay it out there, um, you know, when I say we work in 11 or 12 countries, I, I, I don't, you know, right? I mean, I haven't been, it's not as if I'm going back to Peru or going to, you know, I was in Haiti, but it was, I wasn't in Haiti at one of our projects. I was, I'm working with, you know, President Clinton on a project that's about Haiti. So we have our Haitian staff perfectly capable of, you know, and we have thousands of coworkers in Haiti. And so I just want to make that very clear. As much as I just sort of try to rehabilitate a little bit the quest for personal efficacy, um, I do think that it's important to understand that um, there are millions and probably hundreds of millions of people who would like to do health-promoting work and addressing. And I think finding a way to allow millions or tens of millions or however many to participate, I think, is, is part of the task. So I think, you know, you, you uh, any physician or nurse or, uh, to quote my friend Jim Kim, he says, there's, there's not a long line of people standing in line to serve the poor. And I think, use that symbolic capital that you have as a physician, whether, you know, here or anywhere else, and uh, use it to leverage other resources um, for this effort, I think uh, you know it's not going to require an individual or a, an or you mentioned an organization. I just would like to say, I mean, I say the Haitian organization is all Haitian. There, it's not it's not an American organization. If I may, um, you know, sometimes you think that things happen because there's a grand scheme and someone's got an enormous vision or resources. But in fact, most frequently, the greatest thing that happens is because the people, somebody has an innovative idea that's at the grassroots level that actually influences the institution. And we as leaders should be smart enough to recognize them. Now, the Global Health Institute, despite that fact that Dick and I both said this was important, but actually it was just due faculty. Even as they arrived, there were so many activities around this area on an individual basis and many in terms of one-off basis, that the energy around was so great that all we had to do is just get them together, and it happens. And I bet you you'll find that in ECU. In the back. Right. Thank you so much uh, for this event and for all your work. Um, I wanted to ask a question to the two guests in the President's office. Um, I've recently been studying the intersection between climate change and national security, what people call climate security. Um, and there's about 10 main issues that keep coming up in that conversation, but one of those is the rise of pandemic diseases. And as two leading experts in the global health field, I was wondering if you could share um, some of your thoughts on how climate change will affect global health, uh, particularly with issues of migration as well as the spread of uh, diseases as temperatures rise. Thank you. It's a big question, but a great question. Well, I, mean, I can give a specific example, you know, which is, you know, around uh, 
anything that has a mosquito vector, right? And you know, I could point out that you know you take malaria, say, and you look at high elevation places where you know, malaria was not a problem because the vector wasn't going. Those are moving up. You you can look at um, you can look at the lack of impact of certain drugs that used to be effective, which are now no longer effective. Again, tying this all together, as, uh, as Dick was saying earlier, it's very difficult to single out one one problem, uh, in, like global warming, when in fact it's a whole complex of problems, as you said as well. But so the specificities are really important, case by case. You know, um, vector-borne illness. Um, upper respiratory tract infections, and, and there are, yeah, and, and, and water, you know, what's going to happen to the lowlands, et cetera. Those are all important. But if I were to make a broader point, as you said about um, security, I would say, and I think there's leadership in our, in our country that believes what I'm about to say, and I'm glad they do, that human security is really important. FDR said this again and again. But um, one of the best books that I've read recently is Cass Sunstein's book on the last inaugural that FDR gave called Second Bill of Rights. It's really, it's a 2004 book, it's a wonderful book. And I just was reading it, this reflection on this, the, the rights to security, freedom from want, etc. And thinking, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from, um, from looking back at things that were said already around the link between one notion of security and the idea of freedom from want. From want. And I would say that the climate, the, let's just say that the movement being born around environmental justice and what you're describing as, as climate change, if we link that movement to the movement for social justice, you know, things like fair trade or what I've seen on campuses in like Duke and Harvard and many other places all across this country, including ECU, I might add. I've seen this everywhere. Young people are interested in, this, in global justice issues. Now, bringing this together, um, these movements together, I think is a very exciting, uh, it's potentially a very exciting time um, where we address problems truly globally as we might have and should have long ago. I think that the healthcare professional have not uh, focused as much on those issues which are critically important. I think so education and uh, as Paul said, bring people together is absolutely pivotal. Uh, this last month, the Institute of Medicine's annual meeting, which I had the uh, privilege of organizing, was on global health, uh, on the climate change, water, urbanization, and health. And we brought together people from all different disciplines. But I think what was really eye-opening for the health profession, you know, these are National Academy of Science members that are trying to understand that this is a serious matter and people need to work on this together. So I think that we can work in these... Can I use the word silo? I think you can. <laughs> Silos. But I think that the, the improvement and awareness of this issue, as we talk about health, relates to everything else. I think the environment, likewise, relates to everything else and bringing people together to work on this would be important. You can say stove piping, but the stove piping industry lobby lobbyists are here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I could take one last. This is an intergenerational effort, young man. <laughs> held, my, held this up so that I could speak. I, when I think about the healthcare system in this country, I think about on the one hand the kind of thing where you can zip into a clinic and and take care of your cataracts, and it's all very beautifully done. And then on the other hand, you have a, a system that reminds me a little bit, I'm thinking of the, the sanitation problems in the early part of the last century, when the sanitation engineer made a huge difference in longevity. And I think at this point, we have on the other hand these wonderful uh, innovations and then we have um, people who cannot do the walking that we recommend because their streets aren't safe. So we need safety as part of our global health. And we need 
um, people who can teach people how to cook, um, maybe on a hot plate, so that they can, they have easy recipes that are healthy. Uh, we need to be able to give them or to provide access to healthy foods. We need to be able to teach them or, or provide quiet places so that they can sleep. Uh, and provide things like a nurse, fam a nurse family partnership, say, where um, young mothers are taught how to take care of their children. I mean, this is, there are two different problems. And I wonder, uh, and I know you all have thought about that, if you could just make a few comments. I, I, think, I think health and healthcare is a continuum and I think what you've described is absolutely correct. Uh, we will need these surgeries. We will need these, I think, what the play Christians would call focus factories. You know, you come in, you get fixed, and I think we need them. And in fact, we're very proud of the fact that we have, you know, great cardiac surgery, brain surgery, because the disease, people will get disease. But I think what you're saying is the greatest opportunity is really starting very early before you get disease, or early in the intervening before it progresses to serious disease. And that's the whole spectrum. So therefore, we have to think of prevention, health awareness, health promotion, community workers, and really think about health, and not just healthcare. And then, of course, there always will be need, I believe, for you know, the surgery and the medical care. You know, if, if I... And by the way, that is the creation of a... Can I use the word vertical? Vertically integrated delivery system. Right? Right. I mean, people write about an ideal delivery system is you have the whole spectrum. That, so you can actually think about both from your primary care perspective to secondary and tertiary care. And when you have a system like this, you no longer have to access the hospital or the health system you know, in terms of a fragmented way. It gives you a continuum of care. I just, I would just say I agree with what you said, and I would point out again as another warning. Uh, and you, you, you said it very eloquently, and, and it's been said uh, here tonight two or three times. But the, the silos or balkanization or stovepiping uh, is, you know, one of the, the big traps in, in, in our line of work. And look at Mike Merson again is people who say are for, trying to force people to choose between prevention and care. Another bad idea. So, say for example, you um, you need a cataract extraction, or like me, you know, I walk, your mother says, "Don't look both ways before you cross the street." Follow your mother's suggestions. I walk in front of a car, which I don't recommend as a good experience. <laughs> but you know, it's not like you know, you're, it's not like I didn't need an orthopedic surgeon, you know. And I, I once had an orthopedic surgeon as a guest in, in Haiti, and he was he was pretty. Uh, unhappy with his, it was just so much work, and there was gunshot. Anyway, and after he left, he said, um, "I said, you know, thank you very much for coming. And uh, when are you going to come back?" He said, "I don't think I'm going to come back. Um, I'm going to focus on prevention." And I said, "What would that be?" He said, "I, I think you need to build new roads." <laughs> and, and that that remains true. Okay, it remains true. But you don't want an orthopedic surgeon to become a road construction engineer. <laughs> you know, unless that's some personal avocation he or she might have. You know, let that person be an orthopedic surgeon. Let the cataract extractors extract cataracts. Let the cardiac surgeons do cardiac surgery. So you do you need this whole spectrum, I think, and the systems thinking back to the point that I think of people in the business school would make again and again. Or engineers. They remind us that we need systems logic, whether that's health system strengthening or better delivery systems that have better management. So I think all of us, regardless of what we do, back to ECU and, and medicine, don't be embarrassed to be a doctor. You know, do what you want to do with your, if you want to be a, a clinician, a nurse, a doctor, a social worker, do that. You have to fit into a system where you feel supported. And I think that's one thing a university can do, is you can do that. Uh, the author, Martin Melville, said, hard to be finite on an infinite subject, and all subjects are infinite. Uh, uh, and I'm going to guess that this one is. Uh, but I, uh, uh, if you share my experience, uh, you feel
field, but a subject of general concern has been brought into sharper focus by people who spent their life thinking and spent their life trying to help us do something to thanks so much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu. Thank <laughs> you.